We can go ahead and get started. I'm sure people will trickle in as they're getting over to lunch and getting to their break times. Um, but we want to first, we want to thank everybody for coming. We know it's a Thursday, it's noon, and it's October. So we're kind of hitting that busy time of the year. And so we do appreciate everybody coming out and taking time to kind of have this conversation with us. It's an important one. We want to let you all know we are recording this presentation, hence why all of your cameras have been muted or turned off and then your audio is muted. If you have a question, please feel free to leave it in the chat or you can ask it in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'm with the Office of Care and Civility, so I'm their student services specialist. And so we invited Amy from Hope Store New Beginning Center to come join us in this conversation and kind of help give us information and tools to navigate domestic violence and different styles or symptoms of abuse and how we can help prevent, recover, recognize those signs and what we can do as bystanders to it. But with that said, I'll hand it over to Amy. We'll get started. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I appreciate the chance to come and visit with you all today. I hope that everybody's having a good day. I'm going to jump right in because I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I just want you, uh, I want to be able to also have a few minutes to answer questions. Um, we're going to talk just a little bit today about the dynamics of domestic abuse and family violence intimate partner violence, lots of different names for it. And then I'm gonna share a little bit with you about our agency towards the end and then have a few minutes for questions. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. I am from Hope's Door New Beginning Center. We are um, an agency that helps survivors of domestic violence. We have our outreach in Plano and in Garland, and we also run emergency shelters in Plano and Garland. And we'll talk more about what all that is, uh, what all we have there in, in a few minutes. So. I want to just go ahead and jump in. And um, when we think about domestic violence, most of us um, kind of have a feeling or an idea of what that is. And we specifically think probably about the physical parts of it, but I want to share with you uh, more about all of that today. So we're going to go ahead. And um, so when we think about it, I want to just kind of realize why we do what we do. I'm going to share a few statistics with you here, and I'm certainly not going to read all of this to you because you can read it yourself, but one in three women, and this next one is kind of debated. It's anywhere between one and four men and one in nine men have experienced some form of physical violence with an intimate partner in their lifetimes. Um, that's debated because the statistics come in all different places, but we do know that the number of men is climbing and maybe not just the number that are affected, but the reporting is climbing all of the time. So um, a lot of women, um, a third of women in the United States, that number is the same in the world and in Texas. And so um, a lot of people are experiencing this and some may not even realize that they are. There are a few more statistics there. I wanna call your attention to the fact that um, we have some discrepancy. Um, um, some of the statistics are higher for certain groups. And we know that part of that is because those groups don't always feel safe um, getting the help that they need. And so we work towards that in our agency. Um, everything is bilingual and is completely open to uh, races, religions, LGBTQIA+, anything, uh, any group that someone fits in. And we'll talk just a little bit more about how um, domestic violence affects all of those people in a little bit. So on average, I wanna skip down to the bottom. A victim of domestic violence will leave and return to their abuser seven to nine times. And anybody who's ever been in a relationship like this or experienced it with a family member knows that to be true. Um, and we'll talk about why that is here in a few minutes. And of the total domestic violence homicides, the, the most dangerous time, 75% of the victims were killed who were killed, 75% of those were killed as they attempted to leave the relationship. So that is absolutely the most dangerous time. And one of the reasons why it's so difficult to get out of these kinds of relationships is because it's dangerous to get out. It's much more dangerous to get out than it is to stay in most of the time. And we'll talk about other things that influence people's um, 
ability to get out of these situations as we go on. So just a real quick definition for you. The words I want you to remember as we go through today are power and control, because we know that domestic violence, uh, just like rape, is about power and control. It's certainly not any kind of love, but it, the definition is when someone uses any of these kinds of um, intimidation to have control or power or to change the behavior of the other person in a relationship. Now we're gonna talk mostly about intimate partners today, but we know that this happens throughout um, families um, as well. And in fact, a lot of, I wanna just switch into another uh, topic for one second. We know that uh, there's a huge crossover between intimate partner violence, domestic violence and trafficking. And one of the things that we don't always realize about trafficking is that that happens more often within a family than it does in any other way. And so this is not just about intimate partners, but that's kind of what we're going to focus on today because that's what most people will experience. So uh, when we talk about physical violence, of course, this is the part that everybody knows about that. Um, everybody, because we can see evidence of it. But if you look at this circle with me, you're going to see that there are a lot of different kinds of emotional, uh, um, a lot of different kinds of abuse. And so one of the biggest sections is on emotional abuse. And this is um, a kind of abuse that people often don't even realize that they're that's being used against them. Um, this would be your name calling, playing mind games, humiliating, putting someone down, making them feel guilty, making them think that they're crazy, gaslighting comes under this. And so uh, when I first saw this bill, I was just taken aback. I don't think that all of us realize that all of these things, when they are used for power and control, are being are, are ways to manipulate and ways to abuse. And so isolation, and we're gonna talk more about each one of these a little bit right now, but I just kind of wanted you to see this wheel because this is one of the things that we use in the movement to make sure that people understand all the different ways that they might be being abused. So first, a physical abuse, of course, any kind of, um, you know, grabbing, pinching, uh, pulling uh, hair, biting, all of that, but also denying medical care and also forcing someone to use alcohol or drugs is considered physical abuse. Now, this, of course, is the one that's easiest to prove, the one that you can very quickly get help with because people can see that it's happening to you. But oftentimes, this is the last thing that people will see in the cycle of abuse because it's the it's the end of where someone pushes you to your limits. And so we're gonna go ahead and look at all of the rest of them that lead up to this. Very often, uh, emotional and psychological abuse, and like we were looking at the wheel, this is about control. Um, it's about isolation, pulling someone away from their support network, intimidating. And um, I just wanna talk for just a minute about the cycle of abuse. And when I'm talking about the cycle of abuse here, I'm not talking about how someone who is abused uh, becomes an abuser or, or some, you know, their children become abusers or abused. We'll get to that. What I'm talking about here is within the relationship, there are certain tactics that an abuser uses to keep their victim or the, their survivor in the relationship. And it's a kind of a cycle. So one of the things that we find out about these type of relationships is that oftentimes when a person is, when this kind of relationship first starts, it starts very quickly and it starts with something called love bombing, which is the idea that um, it's almost too much too soon. Uh, we're telling each other that we love each other, you know, within a matter of weeks, we, uh, we constant gifts, constant comparing ourselves to other or comparing one person in the relationship to other, for example, that idea of 
nobody else is ever going to be good for you. I'm the only one for you. We're going to spend our lives together. And so it's just like, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot. And of course, everybody wants to feel love and everybody wants to be in a, in a romantic whirlwind type relationship. But when it happens that fast, that's kind of something that we need to look out for. That's a red flag because um, a lot of times what will happen is that person will start with all of that love bombing. And then a little bit later, they'll start to uh, push against our boundaries just a little bit, push against some of our personal limits. For example, um, you know, a week or you know, three weeks in something like, well, I don't really like that skirt on you. Maybe you should change. I think the other one looks better. Wear that for me. And then immediately we go back to the idea of it's all wonderful. I love you. You're the, you're the best person ever. You're just marvelous. And then maybe a couple of weeks later, pushing against a, a, those limits a little bit more. Like, you know, I really just need you to stay home with me today. I know that your best friend, I know it's her birthday. I know you really want to go, but I don't feel good. And I need you just to just take care of me today. And, you know, we want to be with that person. And we want to spend all of our time with that person. But we have to remember that we have other people in our lives and other responsibilities in our lives. And one of the things we tell younger kids is if the pie of your life starts becoming all one piece and you're you're not taking care of your other responsibilities, not making time for the other people in your life, that's a warning flag because that's a good bet that someone is pushing against your um, that someone is pushing against your boundaries. And so um, as they push and push and push, oftentimes that will, I'm sorry, excuse me for just a second. I apologize. I didn't tell you I was doing this. I'm sorry. You go right ahead. I'm sorry. My dog walk. He just came in and I forgot to tell her. Anyway, as they push um, against these boundaries, we so, we suddenly feel our boundaries just moving and moving and moving. Maybe we don't even recognize that. But then when we get to a certain point, sometimes we wake up and like, how did I get here? And that's kind of this cycle of, of just pushing someone and pushing someone. And almost sometimes this becomes a kind of a dependency on each other. It's almost like both people in the relationship become dependent on this this cycle of back and forth and back and forth and highs and lows and highs and lows and they need that and this is one of the things that happens in emotional and psychological abuse and so this is a, a really important part to know and we can talk a little bit more about that and answer some more questions about it later i want to go ahead and move a little bit forward we also have of the idea of gaslighting, distorting reality, um, and making it making someone feel like maybe they're crazy, things like, well, I didn't say that, or I didn't do that, when you know that they did, but then sometimes it almost makes you feel like, well, maybe, maybe I am crazy, or maybe I just heard that wrong, or, or maybe, um, maybe it's me, maybe it's my fault, and people who are, are suffering this kind of abuse, almost 100% of the time think that it's their fault in some way. And this is one of the reasons gaslighting is a huge issue in these kinds of relationships. Um, and so one of the other things is um, any kind of sexual abuse. And I'm gonna let you look at all of these things real quick. Um, anytime that anybody tries to make you do something with your body that you're not comfortable with, we know that that is sexual abuse. Um, one of the things that, you know, we're dealing with so much these days is a sharing of photos and um, the sharing of just like videos online. And so when we tell the younger kids is that, you know, we know that once that is in somebody else's hands off of your phone and to someone else, it, it, it never comes back. And it's not something that we can um, we can take control back over. And oftentimes those are used for intimidation um and to keep someone uh dependent on the other person so uh the idea of um objectifying and, and you're only good for this or in spanish we say no serious para nada you're not good for anything but me okay as a kind of sexual abuse um and we can to ask, you know, if we have some questions about that, we can go more into that. I want to get to these because this is something that um, is just, 
out there everywhere these days, the idea of the apps on your phone that can allow someone to monitor you or um, access your phone and email. And of course, we know that this often can be done by strangers by just how much information we put out on the internet, but it's also used by domestic violence abusers to keep control of their partners. Um, posting private or fake photos online to make you feel bad, hidden cameras, um, you know, in the home or in the car or just different places like that. And then that idea of cyber stalking, just using the internet to to ambush, to harass. And so when before we had this, you know, so if you were trying to break up with someone, they might show up at your school or at your or at your house or at your work to bother you. But now they, they kind of have access to you all day long, no matter where you are, because they have if they have access to your phone number and they have access to your um, social media accounts, then they can, you know, just harass you from every way. And so that's something that we have to be aware of is how much of that information we give out, not just to the public, but to our partners. And we tell our kiddos that, you know, your social media space, that's your private space. And there's no need for anyone, including your partner, to have access to your password to those things. And if they want access to your passwords, then there's some kind of issue going on. Either there's not trust or there's that kind of need to control. And so um, I think that that's one that even we as um, as adults have to really you know, think about, we love this person. We want to share everything with this person, but if we're sharing everything with this person, then there are no boundaries. And whenever there are no boundaries, then we have, we have issues and we have red flags. And so something to keep in mind. And then a huge one, and we have, unfortunately we have more than one slide about this one. And this is one that sometimes people don't even realize that it's a form of abuse. It's aggravating, it's troublesome, and it makes you feel bad, but we don't necessarily think of it as being abuse. Even if it's stealing, a lot of times women, especially men too, who are used in this way, don't recognize it as abuse. But economic abuse is a, is a very real thing. And of course, it runs the gambit from just keeping your money, withholding money, not giving you any economic resources or any decision making if you're in a home together, to stealing your money because they have access to those passwords and those account names and numbers, um, to denying you the ability to go out and work to get the education that you want to get, to running up debt in your name, you know, if um, getting your credit cards and using them when they don't have permission to use them, or even bullying you into giving them permission to use them to run up debt in your name, um, and then refusing to pay those. And then a few of these, um, just, you know, of course, on the, on the, far end of the spectrum is that idea of keeping someone without enough food or clothing or medicine or shelter. Um, trafficking, this is a, actually making you work in a family business with little or no pay, um, you know, is, is a form of trafficking. That's labor trafficking. And so I don't think a lot of people realize that, but it is making you ask permission for to make financial decisions or, or have your own cards. And then like I was talking about earlier, just showing up when they're not supposed to be at your job, at your school, anything that could affect you or your employment or in some way, that's, um, that is economic abuse, financial abuse. Um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and, and put them in and we can deal with them right then. Or if you want to wait and ask at the end, that's fine. I, I, it's always kind of hard to do a webinar because when I do this in person, I ask the group questions as I go along, but put, feel free to put your questions in if you have them on anything. Um, what I was talking about earlier, this domestic violence happens across all groups. Any kind of group that you can think of, it happens uh, in all socioeconomic groups, cultures, religions. It happens in, in all gender groups or uh, sexual identity groups. Um, it is It does happen more in, in minority groups 
Um, but for example, some of the statistics that I gave earlier were about how Native American uh, women uh, have report more this kind of violence. And then there's a larger group of black women who report this violence more. But I do want to make sure that we understand that does not, that that's who reports it. Those are survivors. That does not mean that the perpetrators are more in those groups because they're not. We know that the average perpetrator of domestic violence is white men. Now, white men can also be survivors of domestic violence. And in fact, we have, you know, instances and, and people that we, we have helped who are white men. So just the idea is that survivors, people who are, are getting through this and handling this and dealing with it and escaping it come from all groups, all groups. Um, so, oh, I'm going to go back for just a second. This is one place that I would like to ha ask some a question real quick. I know that a lot of us have said when we have known someone in this situation or seen it on television or maybe a family member was in the situation and we have probably thought to ourselves at some time, why doesn't she just leave? Even though I lived through this as a child and experienced it later on as an adult, I still said that about other people. And that's one of the crazy things about this is it feels so isolating because sometimes it is. Um, sometimes uh, people will kind of respond to us in that way. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But those of you who are listening, if you could put in the chat, why are some reasons do you think that people don't leave? What are some barriers to leaving a relationship like this? We've already talked about one. Actually, we've already talked about two. But can you think of any barriers to leaving a violent relationship? And I'm just going to stop for a second. Okay, I see that we have something in the chat. Let me see if I can look at it real quick. Uh, fear of retaliation. Absolutely. That that remember, 75% of the of the uh, murders that happen to survivors of domestic violence happen when someone was leaving. Absolutely. Oh, the chat is disabled. Thank you. I apologize. Sorry about that. Okay. Well. That stops that. <laughs> okay, so in the question and answer, then, if anybody else has any um, any reasons why you think people don't leave, we've got someone doing one for us, and we'll move on in just a second. I just wanted, I like to ask this question because sometimes. People are very aware of these reasons, and sometimes we're not. Sometimes we're those people who are kind of at saying, I don't know why she doesn't just leave her. If I were her, I would leave. No access of means, right? Nowhere to go. Children that are involved, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. All right. Oh, thanks. The chat's open now. Good. All right. So yeah, those are reasons why, and let's look at some more because there are a lot of reasons why people don't leave. Let's look at those real quick. Let me get this up. All right, so barriers to leaving. Number one, fear of repercussions, right? Because it's the most, it's the most uh, dangerous time. Number two, love. These are people who have a relationship they love their partner at the beginning, especially there was enough love there between them in, in one way or another, whether one was manipulation or not, to start a relationship. And so we love that person. We don't want to have to walk away from that, especially if it's one that we've been involved in in years and years. Gaslighting, that thing we were talking about a minute ago, that manipulation of your thinking so that someone believes that they're going to hurt the other person if they leave them, that they're dependent on that person and the other person is dependent on them. Um, the love bombing that we talked about, 
what about shame and embarrassment? Family, you know, um, the, the different social groups that we run in, that we weren't strong enough, maybe, as a, especially maybe sometimes as women, we think we should just be able to handle everything, our, everything ourselves and shouldn't need help from anyone. And isolation, this idea, a lot of times um, perpetrators will on purpose move, sometimes physically move their victims further away from family and friends so that they can have more control over them, okay? Um, and also just that idea that if I say something, people are gonna say, well, why don't you just leave? And I know it's more complicated than that. Financial limitations, not having money. We don't want our children not to grow up with a parent, okay? We want them to be able to have that parent, especially if the parent's not hurting the children, which by the way, we know that they are secondary victims, um, suffer a lot, but we don't necessarily think of that always. Religious beliefs, cultural beliefs, and sometimes immigration status, that idea that if you leave me, I'll tell that you're here illegally and you'll get deported. By the way, that is not something that should stand in the way of anybody's uh, leaving because there are two different ways that people who are suffering domestic violence can get citizenship. Um, and, and just being um, here illegally is not something that's gonna get you deported if you're reporting domestic violence. All right, so these are some of the reasons why people don't leave. One thing we have to remember is that even though oftentimes the victim thinks that it's their fault and the perpetrator tells them that it's their fault, it is not their fault. And we can't help in any way if we're blaming them. If we're saying, I don't know why you don't leave. Why don't you just leave? Um, or, and if we're doing some of the other things, uh, saying some of the other things that might blame them. And we'll talk about those um, a little more. It is a public health problem. And these are some of the things that people who are survivors of domestic violence deal with um, and that the public deals with uh, in terms of medical care, in terms of mental health care. Um, and then of course, in terms of future relationships, uh, use of drugs and alcohol and just, and what happens with their children and whether their children develop boundaries, whether their children have these kinds of relationships because that's what they've seen normalized. And that's another whole presentation about the effects on children, but there are definitely effects on children. And a lot of times um, the survivors will think that oh, the kids don't see, and he doesn't hurt the kids, or she doesn't hurt the kids, and the kids don't see, they don't know. Yes, they know. 95% uh, of children who are living with domestic violence in their homes know that they're there, and um, know, and feel guilty because they can't do anything about it, um, and oftentimes are physically hurt trying to do something about it when they feel like they can't let it go on anymore. And so there are definitely consequences for children uh, living in this kind of situation. And like I said, we have a, another whole thing about, you know, how can you be, how can you help a child who's living with domestic violence? So um, we can definitely answer some questions about that, but let's um, move on real quick. So the idea, so if I know someone who is living with domestic violence. Well, the first thing that we need to do is make sure that they don't feel isolated. So if we can, without damaging ourselves, you know, without putting ourselves in physical danger or in mental danger, we need to stay present for them. We need to be that person who will listen, who will not judge them, and will be that person to call 911 when they need physical help. Um, we want to believe their story. We don't ever want to say things like, oh, wow, I had no idea. You would never think that he would do something like that. Or oh, she seems like such a good person. All of that is doubting that their story is true. And we just want to listen. And we literally want to say, I believe you. And how can I help? I believe you. I love you. What can I do? And you want to ask them that question because the one thing that we do not want to do, their perpetrator or abuser 
has been taking their power away and making them dependent on, on him or her. And what we don't want to do is add to that by telling them what to do. Well, you just need to leave right now. The, the survivor knows their relationship better than anybody else. And they know when it's safe to leave and when it's not. And they know when they're going to be able to leave and follow through and when they're not. And I know this is like the hardest part of being a friend to someone in this situation, but it's useless and damaging to the friendship for us to try to tell them what to do when they are not ready to do it. The thing that we can do is to listen to them, stay present, stay that person that they can reach out to when they need help um, and, and just be there for them and tell them it's not their fault because they think it's their fault. A lot of the time they will think it's their fault and they need to hear that. And they mean to hear that a hundred times before they believe it. So we need to make sure that we continue to say that you can be that person that you have a code word with him or her. And when, when they're on the phone with you and they say the code word, you hang up and you dial 911. Okay. Um, and remember that it won't affect their immigration situation. Um, if, if we call 911. You want to offer them community resources like Hope's Door, like Genesis, um, like the outreach. And there's an outreach in Fort Worth, too. I, I've just lost the name of it, but I can get it for you. Um, there are seven programs throughout the Metroplex that offer the kind of services that we do. A family place is another one. So um, there are plenty of places that they can get help. And we'll talk about what that help looks like in just a minute. Make sure they understand that leaving the situation does not mean immediate security. Some statistics show that people uh, who leave a situation like this are in true danger for up to two years after they leave. Um, and so, you know, we know how long a divorce takes sometimes when there are conflicting reports of what's going on. We know how long custody battles can take. We know that some perpetrators who, uh, are, are also stalkers and continue to find out where people are. And so we can't tell them that all you have to do is walk out and everything will be okay because that's not true. But they can walk out and get help and continue to get help throughout the process. Um, and then basically just remind them that love isn't abuse. Um, so I wanna share with you a little bit about our, uh, you know, our community resource, but uh, we are happy for you to get help or get them help from any of these uh, shelters and outreach centers. Another thing you can do is to help them make a safety plan. So if you know someone's in this kind of situation, this would be one of the things that we would do with them if they call us. But you as a friend or as a family member can help them do this as well. Uh, they and children in the home need to practice how to get out of the house safely. What would be the escape route? What's the safest place in the house for kids? By the way, that is not any room with weapons. No hiding in the bathroom. No hiding in the kitchen and no hiding in the garage because there are weapons located there. Um, also, the if there is a, a firearm in the house, it needs to be locked up. If there is an unlocked, well, if there's a firearm in the house at all, that just magnifies the danger to about 500%. And I'm not making that number up. Um the danger of, of physical harm and of murder by about 500%. So, but if, the, if it can be locked, that gives a few more seconds of time to get away. And so just being aware of what dangers there are in the home uh, can be a huge help in, in a safety plan, making sure that the children know how to call you or how to call 911 or both, having a code word with you and them, planning ahead of time where to go if they have to leave, whether it's going to be a shelter, whether it's going to be your house or some other safer house. Um, if you are the friend and the perpetrator knows that you're the friend, another place might be safer um, if they have to get away um, without notice. 
um, move, you know, when they sometimes uh, survivors know when things are about to get bad. So that just having a plan to move to a, the safest place um, and then having a ready bag. And um, can you just put in the chat for me or in the question and answer, what do you think should be in that ready bag? If you had to walk out of your home without notice and possibly never go back, what are the things that would need to be in the ready bag? Now I'm going to check my time while we're waiting to see if some people can tell us I think we're in good shape. All right, let's see what we have here. A burner phone, yes, cash, contacts, ID, money, birth certificates, appropriate clothes, underwear, toiletries, all of those things. Yes, personal documents, your social security card, birth certificates, those things don't need to be in your wallet anyway, but they do need to be in that ready bag if you have to uh, get away. Good, medication, absolutely. All of those things are true. So you all would be, if you combine all of your answers, you have it. Cash, not credit cards, not debit cards, because those things can be uh, traced. And so just some cash stored away would be the most, the, the, the best thing. All right, so. I want to talk to you now about um, those services that we said, just providing services. So Hope Store New Beginning Center offers um, emergency shelter, but I will tell you that we have about 55 beds between our two shelters and they, um, they stay full a lot of the time. But that does not mean that if someone calls us that we go through a list of questions and we ask them all of these questions. And if they say yes to certain questions, um, like has the person ever tried to strangle you, put your, put their hand on your neck. If they say yes to that one, that's an instant you need to get out of the home. If they answer those questions in a way that makes us know that they're in that kind of danger, then we uh, we help them find emergency shelter. If that's not our center, there's a number that we call to um, a lot of the shelters in Texas and outside of Texas until we can find them a bed. Um, and, and maybe that's a bed for them and their children as well. So we don't just leave someone in danger. Um, we will help them find it. Now, if they call in and they don't answer all of those questions just like that, Thank you so much. Um, then we, we sometimes they go on a waiting list, like they would like to leave, but they're not in immediate danger. And so sometimes they will go on a waiting list unless, for, unless they become in immediate danger. Besides the shelters, we offer free therapy that's for survivors and their children, consultancy and case management. Um, so they get... Um, all the all the resources that our case managers can find, like maybe they need help getting Medicaid because they don't have health insurance without their partner, or maybe they need help um, finding uh, bilingual services for their student for their ki kids who are in school, or maybe they need help with um, figuring out their immigration issues or whatever. We have consultancy for that. We have legal assistance. We have four um, lawyers on staff who work um, helping people get divorce proceedings going, protection orders. Um, and then we have transitional housing when people are ready to leave the shelter, but they maybe have not been able to um, um, save enough money or, or have a job on their own yet. Um, we help them find transitional housing that's maybe a you know a little cheaper and and help them because they may not have all the resources they need to to know how to get that housing. And also we we provide there's one uh, option where we provide like up to one year of rent assistance. It is a process. It's a long process and there's waiting lists for that. but people do get through and get into the homes with rent assistance. Um, we have also a program for offenders. I'm going to go on just a little bit here. I think. 
have, yeah, this is kind of how our agency works. I work on the community education team, go out and talk to people. Like I'm talking to you right now, a lot of times to youth, but any kind of of students, any kind of community groups, uh, any kind of professional groups that need education, we talk to. We have, of course, our survivor services that I was just pointing out. We also have um, an offender program, our BIP program, where people who have been appointed, court appointed to get help can come in. Now, out of all of these services, the only one that anybody has to pay for is the BIP program. And we believe that those people should be held accountable for their actions. So we ask that they do that. These are some quick pictures of the insides of our shelter in Plano and then our shelter in Garland. And all of these furniture items were donated all of the uh, money for the uh, the play place at, at both uh, places in the garden um, has been donated. So we function on grants and donations. Um, and this is our, our batter's intervention program, our BIP program, like I was talking about. Um, this is what people can expect. It's 24 weeks long. They do have to pay for it. The, we do have a BIP program for women as well as men. It's separate. Um, they work on knowing the kind of things that we're talking about right now and figuring out why they're doing what they're doing and how they can do better and just taking being accountable for um, for their their actions. And I just want to put this out there real quick. A lot of times survivors think that perpetrators only do what they're doing because they were drunk or because they were high or because that's the way they were treated. And those things do make are triggers, okay? Being high and being drunk can cause the violence to come faster, become more. Um, being treated that way when, when they were young is probably one of the reasons that they act the way they do. But we know that this is, this is an intentional choice that people make, okay? Violence is a choice. It's not something that they were forced into because, and we know this because most perpetrators can have normal, healthy relationships outside of this relationship. They can act the way that they're supposed to at work, treat other people that they don't feel like they have power over correctly. And so it's a choice. Uh, all those things can make it worse and can make it harder on them, but it is a choice. And so we don't ever need to let survivors think that they can't help it. Perpetrators can help it, and this program helps them to learn that. Um, we also have so I want to talk about another aspect of our our um, is our resale store. It's in Plano. This is one of the places where people can go to volunteer. Um, they can volunteer here. They can also volunteer at our twenty four hour hotline, and we'll talk just a little bit more about that in just a second. But um, yeah, we take nice clothes uh, and resell them and all the profits go back into our agency. Uh, there are jobs that come up quite often here at the resale store on our, our website. And so if this is something that you would, you know, you would like to work there or you would like to volunteer there or you just want to drop off some clothes or you want to shop there, um, that helps our outreach. And then here's our social media. And we are very active on social media. Our director of development is actually on vacation for a couple more days. And so normally we have several posts a day, but it's been kind of quiet since she's been on vacation because she does all that. But uh, we're very active and you can find out anything that I've talked about today on our website or on our Facebook or Instagram. We have TikTok, um, so everything is there. So ways that you can get involved if you would like to help, um, like I said about the resale store, volunteer in person at the resale store, 16 or older with a guardian. Um, at the shelter, 18 or older, it's a four hour uh, training to work the hotline and volunteer at the shelter. It's a really good training and they always need volunteers. So if that's something that you would like to do, we can get you set up for that. Uh, we have all of these places where you can make donations on Amazon, um, on our website. You can have someone like me come and talk to other groups that you're involved in. Um, and 
just basically share what I've shared with you today with anybody who will listen, because you may not know if they need it or not. And if you share it and they listen, then they've gotten what they need to out of it. Um, and then just send anybody that you know who needs your help our way. I'm really excited to share. I don't know how many of you will know somebody who's in ninth through 12th grade, but um, this is kind of my baby right now. We're starting a youth advisory council. And for right now, it's just ninth through 12th grade. But um, if you know of a student who's in high school uh, who would be you know, likely to participate, uh, this is through our Plano Outreach Shelter, but we have people volunteering from Dallas, from Collin, all of Collin County. Um, and so if, if you think that that would be something good for a youth that you know, we would love to have them apply. And I think... That was fast, but um, yeah, we still have a few minutes for questions. So what can I answer for you if I didn't hit something in the um, in the presentation? What are some things that doesn't have to be about something that was in the presentation? And I may not have the answer, but if I don't have it, I will find it and I will get it to you. I was just at uh, UNT Dallas uh, for their Welcome All in Her Shoes event last weekend and got to meet some undergrads. It was really cool and some grad students out there. Okay, let's see. We have, um, oh, yes, thank you for, absolutely. That's from Dr. Mo. You're not by any chance the Dr. Mo that I met out at UNT Dallas, are you? That's what I thought. Well, how, how fun that I just mentioned that. And there you are. So nice to, to make contact with you again. That's awesome. All right, any other questions? Okay, here we go. For someone not in serious danger, do you have ways to help find affordable housing instead of going into shelter? Yes, the housing can apply to someone who's not in shelter. Um, if we have, you know, th there is a waiting list, but yes, we do provide a transitional housing for people who are not in shelter. They go on the waiting list and, and the, the waiting list is by, by need. So if someone is in the shelter and they, you know, need to get, need to move on from the shelter, they would probably be above someone who's not, but we do provide those housing. Um, and, and it's not just our housing. Our caseworkers can help them find other housing that might be affordable as well. So I would definitely recommend uh, the only requirement is that they're being affected by domestic violence. If they are affected by domestic violence, all they have to do is call our outreach, make an appointment to talk to someone, and they'll get a caseworker, and then they can start working on that. Good question. I sent the uh, I sent the link at the beginning of to uh, Sophia, I believe. So uh, they should be able to share that with you, absolutely. Yes, like I mentioned at the beginning, we did record this presentation. We'll be uploading it to our YouTube and we'll have the link in the bio there. Um, and I can also email it to you after this, Julie, if you would like as well. Great, all right. Let's see, that's the chat. Let me look at the Q&A. Advice for future doctors, PAs, PTs, pharmacists. I think the more education that you can get about how to be trauma-informed when you're dealing with patients, the better. Um, I think that, well, in just the research that I've done, especially looking at trafficking, um, a lot of times, unfortunately, people who are involved in this kind of situation or in trafficking do not feel like they get help from the medical medical services when like they should because um, they don't always know how to say what they need and and maybe, the um, the nurses, the doctors, the PAs are not necessarily asking 
the right questions. You know, there's a checklist that like if you go into emergency room, there's a checklist where people, a nurse will ask you um, all of, you know, are you are you um, experiencing domestic violence? Um, is anyone force themselves on you? Just different, you know, the whole checklist. But what we hear from survivors is that sometimes that it just feels like someone's trying to get through a checklist. And so I know that um, that the jobs are so hard and that oftentimes you're so tired. But I think that if you can keep refreshing your education about how to be trauma informed and how to talk to patients in that way, if you'll just keep refreshing that and on this then maybe you'll remain aware of the need to take time and really listen and really look and really ask those questions um, so that it just doesn't become something that you just need to get through. Of course, sometimes they're not, even when they do need help, they're not gonna answer them, but for every survivor who gets away, there comes a point when they're ready. And if you're the doctor or PA or PT, or pharmacist who is there at that point, if you're really listening and asking the right questions, then you'll be able to help them. I wish that I knew a better answer than that, but I just will tell you that from our end of the research, sometimes medical facilities and police, unfortunately, they're not perceived as being very helpful because they see so much of this that it's almost like they become blind to it um, or, or feel like they can't really do anything about it or that people, like they get frustrated with women who go back, which if you put yourself in danger to help someone and then they go back, I mean, we can kind of understand that, but we just looked at the reasons why they go back and why they don't feel like they can leave. And so keeping that in mind, I would think would be the most helpful thing. How can we make our exams more trauma aware? Um, there's so much training uh, about trauma awareness available right now. I would be very willing to uh, reach out, but so let me give you a couple of, of agencies. Um, TCFV, Texas Council on Family Violence. Um, has a lot of information, research, and, and my guess that is that someone there would be able to uh, put you in touch with trauma-informed training for uh, the medical field and for the mental health field. I know trauma-informed training comes through our, um, our email serves all of the time. Um, so I feel like it's out there. Um, Texas Council on Family Violence is the place that I would start because that's the one that I know reaches out to us for trauma-informed care ser uh, services. Um, but I can see if I can, what else I can find. Trauma-informed exams. I will see what else I can find and share with you all. but TCFB is where I would start. Okay, I don't see any more. If you have any more questions, um, I thought that I had my, I think, oh, it's the next slide. Oh, if you have a minute to take this feedback survey, that would be great. Um, this helps um, with our grants and, and with us making our presentations better and more informed. So if you have a minute to scan that with your phone and take it, that would be great. I'll put it back just a second. I wanna share also my information. There we go. That's my information right there. And if you want to reach out to me with any specific questions um, and you would like me to give you anything in particular, if you'll just email me, I will get right back in touch with you and let you know what I can find. So those are mine, that one and then, um, I can put the survey back or you can take the survey that it's going to go out in the um in the link so if you don't want to do that right now and you want to do it later do it if you can because that helps us all right any more questions 
think that's it. Thank you, Amy. That was really informative and impactful. I appreciate sure. you taking time out of your day to do this for us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, that being said, I want to thank everybody who came out, watched the video, or watched your presentation, and then interacted with us. Those were always great. If anybody has any questions, like Amy said, you can reach out to her. Um, we also have the care team. You can go on to our website, the OCC website, and refer a person of concern, talk to Title IX, or even talk to the HSE PD if you have any.